James for inviting me to talk about some work we've been doing for a couple of years now on uh, suspension problems in fracking and drilling. And this work was done primarily by uh, two great graduate students, Saurav and Srinath. Saurav actually now works for Halliburton, who's one of the funders of this work. Uh, my computational collaborator is Gianluca Iaccarino, who's at Mechanical Engineering. Uh, and then Jeff Morris and Peng Tamankul. Uh, Peng is actually at Halliburton. Jeff is at CUNY, and they did the experiments that I'm going to talk about. Uh, we originally were funded by Halliburton. We continue to be funded by Halliburton, but now we also have an NSF grant. And yes, those are strange bedfellows, and I'll explain to you probably why uh, we're getting funding from those. And most of the first part of the talk is actually in these two publications. Uh, Ian Frigard did a really good job of introducing this subject. Um, so what you should know is that almost all the fluids in the oil industry are polymeric, uh, even slick water, which is mostly water with a little bit of polymer. And there are at least two reasons for that. Um, one is lubrication. Uh, so drilling muds, for example, uh, are polymeric because of turbulent drag reduction, primarily. Um, the second fundamental reason, and this is what I want to focus on in this talk, is that for both drilling muds and fracking fluids, they are polymeric because supposedly the polymer helps support the particles that are in the fluid. So for example, in drilling muds, those particles are cuttings from the drill blade. For uh, fracking fluids, it is propent, and the polymer supports these particles. Now how that happens is actually interesting, and it was discovered in a quote-unquote Edisonian way. Uh, and therefore, there are formulas for these things that have evolved over time, and there's big money, especially Halliburton is actually the largest supplier of fracking fluids in the world. Um, and the problem with not knowing how things work and then selling them is that when you change the formulations, you can get them to not work. And they are now changing their fracking fluid formulations, and suddenly they don't support the propent very well at all. And so that's when they started to ask us what, what was the fundamental physics of how these support uh, propent to begin with. Before we go, oh, yeah. there are so many interesting things on that, but just that lower left-hand picture. What is that yellow? This is the first time some that snake. Anything. Oops. Yeah, the yellow snake. Yeah, no, I, I, sorry, I, I, I don't know. Uh, I, I pulled this from the web, and this is a drill, so I, I don't know. But I'll figure it out for you before. Snake. Excellent, Eric. Yeah, I, I will. I, I promise. All right. So um, the, the interesting things about these fluids is that's right. They help support propent or cuttings. They actually do it better when the flow is happening. So in other words, when the drill is on the sedimentation velocity of the cuttings is actually lower than when it's off, which is a good thing because if the cutting sediment while the drill's on, the drill tends to bind. Um, this has actually been known in the oil industry for apparently a couple of decades, but if you go into the literature and try to find fundamental uh, reasons for this, you come on the first paper, which is in the early 90s by Ben Vandenbrühl and co-workers. This is a, what you do is you drop a ball bearing in a coet cell. So you have your coet cell, you're controlling the shear. You drop the ball bearing, so there's orthogonal shear like there is in a drill bit. And then as the shear rate increases, the sedimentation velocity decreases. And it actually decreases rather dramatically for these fluids, you see, by a factor of two. Okay, so there's some coupling between the shear and the perpendicular direction and the uh, sedimentation velocity. And I should say that the Reynolds numbers here are small. So it's not an inertial coupling, it's an elastical, elastic coupling of unknown origin. And actually, if you read this paper, there's a discussion of networks, etc., cetera, um, which isn't really valid because these are about 1% solutions. So these are polymer solutions that are actually quite dilute. Um, these are experiments that are done at uh, Halliburton. And here you're at 20% volume fraction, so not individual particles. You're sedimenting them in a, again, in a coet cell, and this is a 20% volume loading. This is a standard fracking type fluid, and what you see is the interface now decreases or, or slows down as you increase the shear rate of the coet cell. So the same phenomena, except now it's at finite concentration rather than single particle concentration. So both of these are indicating uh, good situations. This is to indicate that you can mess this up in a very simple way. So on the left, 
is a bad fracking fluid. On the right is a good fracking fluid. These are guar gum solutions, typical for fracking fluids. And on the left, as you impose shear, again in this Coet cell, the settling velocity goes up, whereas on the right, the uh, settling velocity goes down. Um, the only thing that's been done here is you increase the concentration of polymer on the right and you increase the amount of cross-linking. So this is an example where the people at Halliburton didn't know why this one was good and this one was bad, and they came to us to start to understand the physics of this. Eric, when you say cross-linking, what gets linked to what? Right, so the individual guar molecules are essentially linked through a cross-linker, through a boring cross -linker. So you are, in some sense, setting up globules of linked guar gum in this fluid, more so than in this fluid. Okay, um, you should also know, and I won't go into this, that the individual particle uh, problems have been, have been done, or at least there's a literature on them. So there are spheres sedimenting, uh, there are spheres sedimenting all by their lonesome in elastic fluids. There are spheres in unbound shear flow in the absence of gravity. And there's been uh, quite a bit of analysis of that. And if you go back, you see around uh, 2000 or so, there are large-scale computer simulations of these individual uh, problems. But there was no, has been no uh, simulation of the combined effect. Um, the reason being, I think, is that people didn't know that it was an interesting problem. There is a perturbation theory in 2012 for weakly elastic fluids. That actually added confusion because it turns out, as I'll show you, that this perturbation theory does not match the experiment. Um, so there was a question about what the physics was that arose from that. There's also no general uh, purpose tool, by the way, for suspensions in viscoelastic fluids for kind of the obvious reason that the fluid is then complicated as well as the particle motions. So we also wanted to get involved in developing that. So by the end of the talk, hopefully I'll show you multi-particles. Uh, but for now, we're still at the single particle problem um, because we don't understand the physics of even that. Remember, the original experiments were ball bearing. So here's the computational setup. You go to the center of mass of the particle. So now the particle is fixed and you have a flow velocity U on it. Um, the, these are at real walls and so you apply the shear uh, in the orthogonal direction. Uh, and then this is a typical domain. It's periodic boundary conditions in this direction, uh, flow through boundary conditions in this direction. There's an analytic solution uh, for just the shear without the particle, so you can tell how far downstream you have to go in order to get a good return to the analytic solution. And then this domain actually turns out, this direction here, uh, perpendicular to the part of, to the uh, direction of the sedimentation is actually important. And I show one that's actually the dimension that the original experiments by Vanden Brule were done in. But in reality, it turns out you have to go to very large distances before the walls actually don't affect the drag coefficient on this particle. And that's something we discovered in doing this. And, and there are reasons for that. Uh, because you're in the reference frame moving with the particle now instead of the sedimentation velocity, you're looking at the drag coefficient. If the drag coefficient goes up, effectively the sedimentation velocity goes down. So we calculate the drag coefficient. Um, in order for there to be no torque on this sphere, as there are in everything, there's one component of the spin, as you see here, and you have to calculate that as part of the problem. Okay. Um, the only other bit that you need to know, uh, apart from the dimensionless parameters, which I'll get to, this is conservation of momentum now. For this fluid, it looks like the Navier-Stokes equations, except there's this extra little term here where all the modeling goes. That's the polymer extra stress. Um, if this was 20 years ago, there would be 10 or 15 possible constitutive equations you could write down, and they would all be considered equal in some sense. Thank God we're in a different situation now. So there are constitutive equations that are reasonably accurate for dilute solutions, which is what we're going to deal with. And the two that are typically used are the so-called Feeney P model and the Giesekes model. And they have a very uh, defined statistical mechanics to them. They're essentially nonlinear dumbbell models. So the Feeney P model is a single dumbbell all by its lonesome with the spring force determined by the statistical mechanics of a polymer in between and a constant drag coefficient. The Giesekes model is the same thing except now the drag coefficient depends on the local environment, so there's an extra nonlinear term that gives you anisotropic drag, and that's supposed to be a model for higher concentrations. So those are the two models we'll use. Um, there, there's a whole, I could give you a whole 
talk about center of mass diffusion and Schmidt numbers. Uh, as usual, you want to do the largest Schmidt numbers. Po the Schmidt numbers actually for polymers are 10 to the 6th or larger. Everything I'm going to show you is actually infinite Schmidt number. So we can get convergence in this case for infinite Schmidt number. Uh, remember, this is configuration, not concentration. So the assumption is you've got homogeneous concentration of the polymers, and we're going to make that assumption. But the configuration distribution varies, and that's what you're calculating. And then the stress is related to the configuration distribution through this equation, and then you uh, have to simultaneously solve conservation of momentum with that. Okay. Um, there are, here are the dimensionless parameters, and fortunately enough, uh, there are a number of them that are small and not important. The most important parameter is the shear Weisenberg number, which is the amount of polymer deformation you're getting through this orthogonal shear. So the orthogonal shears are really large, and you get deformation of the polymer because of that, and this is polymer relaxation time times shear rate. When that thing is large, you're getting large polymer stretch created by the shear flow in the shear direction. The Reynolds numbers, now in reality, the Reynolds numbers can be all the way up to hundreds or thousands, and our code does handle that, but the experiments I showed you were for small Reynolds numbers. So we're gonna, I'll show finite Reynolds number, but it'll be small in most cases. Remember, the particles are sedimenting, so they are also deforming uh, polymers because of their sedimentation. So there's another Weisenberg number because of sedimentation deformation. Because they're sedimenting slowly, that turns out to be small. So there's a small deformation, Weisenberg number, which is theta. That's small, so that's not really that important. The other parameters define the fluid, and the most important of those is this thing called beta, which is basically a stress partition. So it's the amount of stress that's associated with solvent versus the amount of stress that's associated with polymer. If beta equals 1, it's all solvent. If beta equals 0, it's all polymer and everything in between. So those, these two parameters are the ones you have to focus on, the Weisenberg number and beta in modeling. And I'll show you that you can actually model the rheology um, of these fluids with this constitutive equation. Uh, go ahead. Is beta measuring the cross -linking? Uh, well, you know, I'd like to say that, and it, and it is, so different cross-linkings will give you a different beta. What this ends up being in a rheology measurement is you take the stuff, you put it in a rheometer, you measure the shear viscosity, and then you get your beta from it. So in some sense, it's a parameter that lumps a whole bunch of stuff into it as, as how much stress is being partitioned between solvent. So where's the shear thinning? Uh, the shear thing is coming from two sources, actually, the finite extensibility, so when you stretch it out, it, it tilts down and that gives you less shear, and the drag coefficient alpha. If the drag on the polymer changes as a function of the stretch, then you'll actually get shear thinning from that. I'll show you fits to rheological data. Uh, okay, I won't say much about the numerical method because of time. It's 10 nonlinear coupled equations now with six configuration equations, velocity and pressure. Um, we took a Newtonian flow solver, uh, which is called CDP at Stanford, and over the last five years, we've made it into an elastic fluid solver uh, in a number of ways. It's a finite volume solver, and the time stepping for the configurational equations is interesting. It's unstructured, uh, and there are a number of papers that we have on this. For example, we've looked at uh, turbulent drag reduction for flow pass cylinders and things using this code. Um, I won't go into it uh, too much. So let, let's go right to the uh, parameters and the uh, interesting fluids. So here, these are all going to be quote unquote good fluids, good fracking fluids. Uh, these are the, uh, this is the fluid from Halliburton. It's a polyacrylamide solution at 1%. This is the shear viscosity that you measure in a rheometer. These are the so-called normal stresses. So when you spin one of these fluids, the plates are pushed apart naturally because of the elasticity you see that you can fit that experiment as well. And this is actually an experiment where you shut off the rheometer and you measure the relaxation of the force, uh, the normal, the thrust force. And you see you get that as well. So the, the point is that the Feeney P model in this case, with these parameters, can then match the shear rheology of these, this fluid as well. This is the fluid that originally Vandenbrühl back in the early 90s looked at. It's actually a 0.01% polyacrylamide solution. And again, we can match the shear viscosity and the steady normal stress for this fluid with this set of parameters for the Feeney P model. So we're happy. We have a fluid that matches the shear rheology. We're going to go in 
and solve the full equation. So here's what we do. We now solve this full three-dimensional nonlinear problem um, for a given height. And so the green dots are our simulations. The black symbols are the original experiments from Vandenbrule. And we were really happy about this because the drag coefficient, as you see, is increasing as the shear rate increases. And we're more or less in the middle of their data. Notice that theta, as I promised you, that's a Weisenberg number that's associated with the deformation due to the sedimentation, is small, less than one, and the driving parameter is the Weisenberg number. Now the red line is that theory that I talked to you about that did not fit the data. And this is uh, part of the problem uh, in this field. And so what did we do? Well, we found out that the green symbols actually depended on this uh, dimension, that is H. So the green symbols were actually done with the correct H that was actually in the experiments by Vandenbroek. And so we just started to increase H, and then at some point, lo and behold, we actually got the theory, the red line, the blue are our simulations now, of the perturbation theory, and they're good for small Weisenberg number, as a perturbation theory should be. But the point is that the green symbols actually have walls in them, as did the experiment. So the difference between the theory, the perturbation theory, and the experiments was primarily because of the wall interactions. And we didn't find that out until we did these calculations. Um, so we're again happy. We think we have at least a simulation that matches the experiments. And so we can presumably data mine these to understand the physics. Um, now here is our uh, attempt to use those same simulations to predict what the one per, uh, the stuff at Halliburton. And remember, the experiments at Halliburton were at 20% volume fraction. The red are the simulations, the black are the experiments. We are getting an increase in the drag coefficient, so that's good, but we're only qualitative at best. So you see that the, we're not matching the experiments. Perhaps you should say, could say that we shouldn't be because it's 20%, but also if you believe this, it means that increasing volume fraction is actually helping you, which is a good thing from their point of view. Um, so anyway, so in order to bridge this gap, presumably we have to go to finite particle concentration, um, which I'll get to at the end. But we soldiered on. We said, okay, we're seeing an increase in drag coefficient in all of these simulations. We want to find out why, because the physics isn't understood. So we did what I think would be a normal thing to do. We divided up the drag coefficient into three bits. Um, these are the normal three bits for polymeric solutions. You got the form drag, you got the viscous drag, which is the Newtonian part, presumably, and then there's the direct polymer drag. Remember, there's polymer extra stresses, they create drag. And then we plotted them as a function of the Weisenberg number. And this is where it becomes interesting because the red obviously dominates, and the red is the viscous drag. Now, when you look at this the first time, you say this has got to be wrong because the viscous drag is there even if there's no polymer. But the point is that the viscous drag is different in the polymer because the polymer affects the flow. So the point here is that what we're saying is the physics of this is actually a change in the viscous flow due to the presence of polymer. So it's an indirect effect rather than the direct effect of the polymers, which actually, as you see, is actually modestly decreasing as a function of Weisenberg number. So this is interesting because it's a flow change. And this should tell you why there's a flow change. This is plots of contours of stretched polymer, magnitude of polymer stretch, at the Weisenberg numbers of the Halliburton experiments. So the shear is going in this direction, and the particle is sedimenting in this direction. Um, and what you see is the, the particle has grown wings, and the wings are the polymers that are stretched because of their interaction with the particles. And you also see that there's polymer stretch at 10 to 15 diameters of the particle width. Uh, and that's also why these domains have to be huge before you get wall effects. So this is, and you might imagine these wings change the flow, and sure enough they do. So uh, if we divide up that drag force into different bits, what you find is that the extra drag due to the viscous flow is actually mostly shear drag. Uh, and so then we plot the flow. Here's the flow streamlines. They're bent enormously by the wings that the particle has uh, grown because of the polymer. And then here's the shear stress 
because streamlines are bent around the particle, you get extra stress on the back of the sphere. So the moral of the story is the computer simulations basically increase, say the increased frictions on the back of the particle because of the polymers, which I find remarkable. But anyway, that's what we're predicting, and that appears to uh, obey the data. Um, and then if you essentially increase the size of the particle, so you have a particle now that's a half the size of the walls, you just shrink the domain, then what? You get extra, even get more stress. So you bend the streamlines even more and you get more stress in the back. Good, okay. How much, do I have any time? Well, it, it did run out. But... It did run out? Okay. Let me just say one last thing then. Uh, suppose you take a fluid that's bad. So here's a bad guar gum solution. This one is, uh, and now we presumably can fit the rheology and figure out why it's bad. And the moral of the story is the reason it's bad is because there's not enough, what? There's not enough solvent. Because it's the solvent that's actually increasing the drag. And so if you add too much polymer, or more specifically, if you add too much polymer stress, the polymer stress, when it dominates, decreases. The viscous stress is actually still increasing, but it's such a small fraction that ultimately the polymer stress wins in this particular fluid case and the drag coefficient decreases. So the moral of the story is there's a sweet spot in solvent stress versus polymer stress that tells you what's a good fracking fluid and what's a bad fracking fluid. If you believe this, then it's the viscous stress that's actually creating the increase in drag, and you've got to have enough of that with an indirect polymer contribution to the flow to create these increases in drag coefficient. All right. Um, that's the, all I had to say. I, I didn't get a chance to go to the multi-particle thing. Obviously, we're much more interested in uh, not just the sedimentation, but whether the particles go in the right place. These are some of the experiments that they're doing now at Halliburton where they're looking at particles going into actually microfluidic devices as models for fractures. And we're very, very busy using um, what is an immersed boundary code to simulate uh, now uh, particles going into fractures. And this is an example of our immersed boundary code where we have predicted the particle uh, essentially split into various fractures. And we can do this for uh, Newtonian suspensions and non-Newtonian suspensions. And I'll probably present that next year. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Questions. Just what you showed at the end, the particle separation, what boundary conditions do you apply? Because this separation is mainly depending on what kind of artificial outflow conditions you oppose at the both uh, channels. Yeah. So, so these are out these are done just like the experiments. These are outflow pressure conditions. So it means you really measure the pressure and then you apply the pressure at the outlets. I mean we impose it in the code. We impose a, fi a, flat, a pressure at the outlet. In the experiments, they try. Okay, so at the experiments, they try to impose the pressure. I, I, I don't know, you, you're aware of it. If you do the same simulation, but if you do the channel slightly larger... Complete. I completely smaller, agree completely with you. I completely way. agree with you, yes. The other, yes. only one remark, uh, one, one keyword, what do you use so if you work with viscoelastic flows, you have the high Weisenberg number problem. Yeah. So what technique do so, you apply? Well, you have the high Weisenberg So there's a couple of high Weisenberg number problems. There are some flows where you actually have a singularity as the Weisenberg number increases. And you actually do have that with the sedimentation problem. So the critical Weisenberg number for pure sedimentation is actually somewhere around Weisenberg number of one or two. Now, that problem can be gotten over in a couple of ways. Every model I showed you was finite extensibility. So the stress is bound by the finite extensibility of the polymer. So the stress actually has a maximum in this particular case. If you do something like old droid B, where there is no maximum, then there's actually a singularity. When the stress is bound, there is no singularity. And that's why it's very you, Yeah, There's no singularity for Feeney flows. And we do time stepping, implicit time stepping, where the stress never steps past the maximum extensibility. So that's why the implicit time stepping on the configuration equations is really critical. 
Go ahead. Every month, if you do Giesekus, you also do Giesekus, so... It's not true Giesekus, it's Fini P. Giesekus. Oh, okay. It's Fini P. Giesekus. Because it's not true Giesekus. Okay, but the stress is bounded, but the problem is the gradient is not bounded, so that means... That's true. And that <laughs> destroys your numerics, typically. That's right. But I, I, yeah. Granted. And, and that's why this is 10 million elements. But you're right. You're late for your meeting. Who's Andy? I got to meet Andy in my higher office. That's, she's my admin assistant. And she can get, look, she can get me wherever I am. It's amazing. Can we have a more optimistic question? <laughs> yeah, so, um, you found these big wings, which were actually. Yes. So, so you, what, what, what can you say in general to get more and more particle, right? So it means actually yeah. the single particle one is only relevant to very dilute. Yes, that's that's actually correct, and I think that's why there's such a big effect with concentration. How do the wings interact with each other? So I I, I hope this is what I hope. I hope they interact like the walls interact with. So what in one sense we kind of were happy that the walls enhance the effect because we also know, like for example, here what's happening is the wings are interacting with the walls. Okay, and so then you're ending up getting an increase in stress. They actually terminate on the wall, or you get some kind of boundary. No, you get some interaction with the wall. And actually, it'd be good. We don't. We haven't actually plotted it up. Okay. Now remember here, the most of the stretch is in this direction. Okay, but there is some angle to those wings, so these wings will interact with the wall. Now, if you look at the structures that sedimenting particles make in viscoelastic, they actually follow each other. So there's actually trains in the gravity direction. And if orthogonal shear is in the perpendicular direction, then you would think, well, I, in some sense, the other particles are acting like walls. They're not quite in the shear direction, but they're above and below. And so they're increasing the distance. So that's what our hope is. Our hope is that particle interactions are like particle wall interactions in some sense. We're getting more bending of streamlines around each individual particle, and that's the particle effect. But I can't tell you. Um, and it's very clear. The dilute in this case is single, <laughs> single ball bearings. So those experiments were unique in some sense. They shouldn't tell very much about the suspension because the interaction length is 10 or 15 diameters away. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Just, just one more. Yeah. Just, um, yeah. Uh, two very quick questions. First, a second order fluid model then completely obsolete. Yeah. So this essentially the perturbation theory was a second order fluid. And so what you see is, this is one reason why we actually went back and did this. And the reviewers, of course, made us go back and do this. Like, why are ours up here and the theories down there? Um, so it, it's good up to a, whatever you say it was, for number of 0.6. And it's good for a huge domain because you can't have, well, that, so that's the answer to that and question. Do these models, these PNB, do they all have second normal stress differences as well? No, they, uh, they have very small, very, very, very okay. small second Just normal stress differences. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Eric. Yeah. Great. Sure.